Welcome everyone to another edition to As Above, So Below Radio. I'm your host, Martin Hodgson, and it gives me great pleasure to have you tuning in today. When you get a chance, please visit the website, holisticadvocate.com. Also, take a moment to subscribe and become a member. Not only will you gain access to the commercial-free subscriber-based interviews, but also treat yourself to an assortment of fascinating people worth listening to. Today's guest is Colin Andrews. Colin is an electrical engineer and a 30-year veteran investigator and researcher into unusual phenomenon. For the past 20 years, Colin has explored investigating consciousness, spirituality, and what we consider non-ordinary reality. Join me in welcoming Colin as he discusses being on the edge of reality. First of all, Colin, I want to extend to you a warm welcome for being on As Above, So Below Radio. Now, for the listening audience, can you give a brief introduction on what got you started on this path towards investigation and research? Well, certainly, and thanks for having me on, Martin. Um, It was back in 1983 when I was uh, a regular uh, senior official in the British regional government, and uh, I was on my way to a meeting driving alone on high ground close to the ancient capital of England before London took the role of uh, Winchester in Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took literally a momentary glance to my left. It was a bright, beautiful, sunny day into a a ripened wheat field, which was in a valley below the vehicle on my left. And um, literally, and it literally was a life-changing experience. I saw a set of five circles, um, which was uh, soon to be uh, coined uh, by, for, by myself, a uh, crop circles. And um, I saw my vehicle. You know, it was very clear to me that this wasn't something very normal. <laughs> I'd never seen or heard of them before, and uh, not many people had. There were a few farmers who had had experiences going back some years, but it had never reached the public uh, through the media. Uh, I was certainly not aware of it. And uh, that's where things uh, changed for me. Uh, I was, uh, as I say, an official in regional government, and um, I really just couldn't uh, shake this one off. Uh, I stopped my vehicle. Others drove past, just like it continued to be a normal day, whereas it seemed to have been primed and... You know, it had a big effect upon me. I I had to do something about it. And uh, that's where the research began. Now, you've also written three other books and co-written six books, correct? Uh, Yes, that's correct. Okay. Now, you cited in the most recent book, by the way, which is called On the Edge of Reality, uh, that we're on the brink of a paradigm shift. Uh, Can you explain what, uh, what you mean by this? Uh, Well, yes, it wasn't a a statement that was made lightly, but it is the only way one can um, interpret the years now, and it's been 30 years of intensive research covering a whole range of subjects, starting with those crop circles back in 83. Mm -hmm. But as soon as it became very apparent to me as an engineer and other scientists working with me that there was another mind, there was something that was aware of what we were doing, and indeed, uh, um, beyond that, which I think we'll probably cover in the program, uh, there was an intelligence involved. And when we could see through the research that this same interaction and presence was there in a whole gambit of other subjects, there was no reason why they shouldn't be linked and looked at, assessed and reassessed in view of that connection. And that is what happened, and that really is the core of the book, mm-hmm. is that there is a... a, 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 a um, a resemblance, a semblance, really, of um, changes in the direction of humanity that appear to be prompted by this exchange, by this intelligence, uh, that um, requires us to address um, what that is. And uh, the outcome of it has been that we are moving from one assessment of reality to the realization of another and the realization that nothing is quite the way uh, it seems. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, the, the experiences, which I think, you, you know, we'll get to, that I've had personally, uh, I didn't ask for them, you know, I've just, I, there is, a, a, you know, just a scientist, an engineer looking for data, gathering information, um, and then it began to experience directly what I would call paranormal, uh, supernatural kind of experiences, mm -hmm. and was hearing this from other people involved, not only in the research, even from people who began then making crop circles, also began to have uh, these strange experiences. And, you know, when, after all these years of investigation, I come to hear um, other people like, you know, military people who have been held very responsible jobs with their nuclear arsenal, for example, mm -hmm. ex uh, relating to me similar experiences, one gets to see that these are experiences, if, you know, if people find them hard to believe, um, they, I think, are in for a shock as we begin to uh, see this take hold, because these are experiences their ministers having, their famous uh, pop stars are having, um, you know, their military people, their presidents, their popes. These are experiences that many people are having, and it's a new discussion that w we now require. And I think reading through those, what, 320-odd pages, it would be hard to leave that book without uh, seeing and acknowledging uh, we need a new discussion about what reality actually is. That's interesting. Now, does this shift uh, also involve the perception of time collapsing and dimensions coinciding? Because, no, that's, uh, that, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry, because it seems that more and more people are seeing what was considered uh, fantasy or something uh, out of the ordinary, something just exclusive to mystics. Um, that's my interpretation there. Yeah, and I would share it. I would absolutely share it. I think it's worth uh, kind of putting into our discussion, placing on the table here, that uh, inattentional blindness is a part of this. You know that uh, I think what we say in the book here is that inattentional blindness, the failure to notice a, a fully visible um, you know, scene in front of you, but unexpected, and, and it occurs you know, when our attention is engaged so fully in one direction that we overlook or look through uh, anything else that is out of context. Although the term blindness, you know, obviously implies that the object isn't seen, some research indicates that the object is seen, but dismissed as unimportant and then not remembered. In other words, the uh, inability to perceive something for which we do not have a context is related to uh, how we process it. Mm -hmm. um, being unable to perceive uh, what we don't expect may be one reason why in the past people didn't experience as many high strangeness events as they do today. Our cultural beliefs have changed and are making those um, experiences uh, less unexpected, if you see what I mean. Right. Well, we are seeing some extraordinary changes affecting the planet. Uh, I would call it a cleansing process. I mean, we're seeing an increase in the frequency of floods, volcanoes, earthquakes, uh, widespread social unrest, wars, and even rumors of wars. Is this all part of the brink of the paradigm shift? Yeah, absolutely, Martin. That that's uh, very much the way that I see it. Though I think that um, you, the fact that we don't fully understand what's happening to us here, uh, we need to look very laterally and well outside of the box. As you rightly observe, and it, it was very much ground that uh, Cynthia, my wife, and I covered in our research for the Complete Idiot's Guide book on 2012. You know, 2012 came and went, you know, the Hollywood created the myth that it was going to be the end of the world, of course, mm -hmm. which tended to create a kind of um, a blind illusion that the Mayan, you know, and I'm not going off at a tangent here, it might appear that I am, but that the Mayan um, prophecy was it totally inaccurate, whilst in fact it was totally accurate. You know, we, we didn't get, I didn't personally get to talk to or, or find any uh, serious 
researcher who ever said it was going to be the end of the world, that we're looking here at the Mayan 25,000 year cycle, where all of the, the kaleidoscope of subject matter that you have just raised here, uh, it was in uh, their vision, you know, in astrological and astronomical terms, at the end of that cycle, they perceived all these things colliding at a crossroads. And that's exactly what has happened. I mean, this has been, I believe, one of the most accurate prophecies that we have come across. You know, it, it, uh, this has, it, is a wonderful piece of work, you might say, mm -hmm. that, you know, the climate, the, uh, you know, obviously global warming, climate change, the economics collapse, you know, the, the, eight, the seven billion people and the, you know, the resource that goes with that, it's all in conflict with each other. You know, the systems are struggling. The infrastructure of, of nature and the infrastructure man that created himself are colliding on a crossroads, which requires extraordinary measures to not only understand, but how we are together to move off of this in a, in a positive um, and long-lasting, more peaceful, more loving direction and you know that's the debate here and there's a lot of pieces to this pie uh, one of which uh, you you very um, succinctly put it you know that that that, that, that this seems to be um, and I don't you know miss sure what you're saying part of uh, what's actually occurring it's multifaceted um, and uh, it, 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 you know I, I think that's exactly what uh, what's what's going on Interesting. It just seems that in order for us to see the light that we're, we have to go through the darkness. And what comes to mind here is that humanity is in that cocoon phase. It's still in the darkness and will one day burst into a new glorious uh, form and see the light. Now, I want to just uh, diverge here, if, if you don't mind here. Um, sure. You had... Um, you had mentioned in the book that uh, you had what appeared to be a dream, but in fact was an alien encounter at the age of five years old, which left you with a burn type of a rash. And through hypnotic regression, you were told um, by the being uh, that he apologized for what he did, but was necessary for a future time. Can you go further into the story, Colin? Uh, yes, it's one that I don't often talk about, Martin, mm -hmm. because, um, well, and I'm happy to do so now. Uh, this has been one that's been locked inside of me for, mm -hmm. well, since I was five years old. Mm -hmm. And there have been, uh, you know, I've, I've had to, uh, you know, think hard about whether I should ever say anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason was, I think, that, you know, I, I kind of stumbled into this research, and it's taken over 30 years of my life, but uh, in kind of stumbling over it, I asked, you know, I initially asked why that set of five circles meant so much to me. It was like I was already uh, wired uh, to uh, uh, see and recognize and take a serious and direct action uh, when it occurred, which is what I did. You know, it changed everything for me. You know, my, my, my marriage broke up. I left my country. I left a very well-paid government job. Mm -hmm. And uh, all because I felt this was, uh, you know, was something I, I was meant to do. And um, so whether that is true or whether it is true, but whether it, it was wired in some kind of strange way for me to recognize and react to might hinge in some way have been influenced by this strange experience that I had. I've always related, you know, to my, my family, um, my mum and dad and my brother and sister uh, know about this in detail because, of course, they were there also mm -hmm. uh, when, you know, at five years old, I had what I said were dreams. I couldn't relate it any other way. Um, I had this tugging um, sensation in my solar plexus. I was asleep. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, you know, my, my siblings were too. And suddenly there was a wrench and I was floating. And uh, I could see my sister and my brother in the bedroom uh, below me. Uh, I was floating just up underneath the ceiling and uh, moving towards under... N there was nothing here that I, I knew instinctively. This was nothing I was doing. I was... Something was doing this. Um, but it was me. I was... It was my experience. And uh, 
I moved towards the wall at the back of the house, uh, facing the back of the house, where there was a field. And um, my actual physical memory, and for um, many years, uh, ended right there. Uh, This happened twice on two separate occasions. And again, my memory would not move beyond the wall where I, I, I could see and uh, floating in that room. Well, I was then, um, because I became well known in you know, the research, and uh, um, I was approached by a, a Professor Jim Harder, uh, University Berkeley, who had been working with um, uh, Alan Hynek, Professor Alan Hynek, on the uh, Br- American government's uh, Project Blue Book mm-hmm. uh, into the UFO subject. Uh, uh, Jim Harder had uh, already at that point when he approached me uh, to be regressed, um, had uh, regressed Barney and Betty Hill, the famous abduction case, and also Travis Walton uh, and uh, his colleagues who had had uh, another UFO experience. Uh, much of incidentally of both of those cases also um, happened to me. And... Um, the long story short is that I was regressed. I initially didn't want to go through that. I wanted to hold on to the memory that I had of a dream. Uh, I, I guess in some ways I was fearful that um, what I was about to be uh, experienced and told and then remember, which I now have, mm-hmm. uh, perhaps wouldn't be something that would sit well with me. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, it was extremely emotional, I have to say. I, I can talk about it now without the emotion, but this is something that locked me up uh, very seriously. I couldn't help but cry uh, each time I would relate what happened because now I'm going um, towards the wall and I go through the wall and this is now new memory. This went on for, the regression went on for about 45 minutes Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, I floated outside uh, towards a very bright white light that was uh, in the field, and it was positioned on the ground. Um, I floated between two military, um, two what looked like soldiers. They were in U.S. military uniform, mm-hmm. and they were very serious. They had no expression at all on their face, very cold-looking, actually, as if they were involved in something that you know was kind of pretty serious. And I floated between them, um, pretty well at head head level, and um, not knowing what was going to happen as I approached this very bright light. It was so bright, I couldn't see anything beyond it. And suddenly, it was like, now I'm inside. I was just like being sucked into a bubble. Um, I was inside, and um, the whole... The whole light, lighting level and color changed to an amber color. It was much easier to deal with. And uh, I floated down. I was moved down horizontally and was facing immediately on top of this uh, kind of an aluminum colored plinth, an all in one piece, like a molding. Uh, it wasn't like built of rivets and things like that. It, it was just a one single piece unit. And I came down onto that. And looking at my feet, and immediately saw that there was a, an entity um, with um, large eyes, almond shaped um, uh, eyes that were um, larger than ours, but not tremendously large. Mm-hmm. And it said in my head, which is where you start at this point, um, you know, we we're sorry to be doing this, but this is for a future time. And uh, I was given lots of information. Um, about plants, about the environment uh, in the future, Mm -hmm. and the critical situation that that lay out ahead. Uh, It told me where to find a particular oak tree and two species of primrose and a bluebell, species of plants that would be growing at the base of this particular tree, and that the biologists would be able to um, assess, measure and assess the actual physical condition of the planet um, by the, the processes of those plants and their interaction. Hmm. And uh, there was a lot more to it, Martin. It would fill the entire program. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. You know, a lot more to it. But it, it went on to tell me of events that would happen, and they did. Mm-hmm. We flew back, Cynthia and I flew to England mm-hmm. following this regression and precisely discovered, and yet I had lived in that house and my family for some years near Stonehenge, mm-hmm. and found that in the field, 
this uh, field of grass uh, was growing where the bright light was, I walked straight to it, um, was, and still is to this day, a 35-foot diameter uh, ring uh, growing, seen very clearly by uh, very mu much healthier plants, darker green plants that are growing in a perfect ring where that light was. Mm -hmm. um, so long story short is that the reality of it was enforced upon me, cemented into my being by the fact that the information I was given during regression by Professor Harder uh, is there on the ground. I have found that up I went I walked straight to the oak tree. I mean, it, 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 I don't know as an engineer myself uh, how that information could be known uh, by me uh, uh, without it having actually had occurred, have a, having occurred as it, as it unfolded during that uh, regression process. You know, it's interesting because when I read the passage, um, it, it just seems as if though these beings, they had a certain sense as to what this planet would uh, incur in terms of pollution and environmental toxins. And your your book goes into great detail about Chernobyl. Um, and I want to ask you this. What's your opinion on Fukushima? I mean, the book cites that this facility dumped 11,500 tons of radioactive water into the Pacific yeah. Ocean. Um, yeah. That's amazing. In your opinion, is this the worst nuclear power disaster to date? Yes. Yes. I, I don't think there's any question. It's actually something that I'm still delving into. I'm, you know, quite wired into the um, the um, um, the research that's going on there, the, the, the measures that are being taken and just about to be undertaken, the largest civil engineering project, the most dangerous that's ever been undertaken on this planet, mm -hmm. is about to commence at Fukushima uh, in, in trying to unravel the many, many, many tons of spent fuel rods that are there and uh, are in a very extraordinarily dangerous state. There is no question that we uh, uh, regrettably have not been well served again by the nuclear uh, monitoring agencies and the governments. Uh, you know, that it's far from transparent um, in what is actually happening here. We, we have three reactors that are in meltdown and actually melting down into the core of our planet going through strata after substrata. There are 300 tons of uh, nuclear uh, contaminated water that they have at, the cur at this current day have no control over. They have, they have no way of containing uh, the vast amounts of water necessary to cool those reactors in the surrounding area uh, without dumping it. And it, it is flowing at 300 tons a day into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it, it is a, an absolute catastrophe, which need never, of course, have happened. We couldn't control, of course, we could not control the uh, earthquake uh, and the tsunami mm -hmm. that perpetuated, uh, you know, the calamity. Uh, we sure knew where we were placing the largest nuclear re reactor site on the planet on top of the you know the, mm -hmm. the this earth strata um we knew that we you know i i, I don't perhaps go too heavily into the political side of this but mm -hmm. you know it's a time to call a spade a spade you know and we're, th yeah this this is a very serious situation uh, there's no question now would you um also in basically state that the gulf oil spill is just as um tragic. I mean, it, it just seems that the Gulf Stream has been affected on a worldwide basis. Yeah, I, I don't think there's, there, there's very little in the life support systems of our planet Earth that hasn't been seriously affected uh, by man's action, especially in the last you know, couple of years. Well, the last 30 has been a disgrace, but the last couple of years, the you know, the, the, the calamities that have happened one after the other in the Gulf with BP, uh, you know, out, out there, you know, in, in Japan. Um, and there, of course, there are many others that, you know, um, that, that, that occur almost kind of by the day, perhaps not on that scale. Uh, we, we've got to, there's a lot we've got to do, but I think what we, we truly have to, to piece, we have to reconstruct 
our systems and, and our political institutions. We've got to get down to the core values of humanity. We've got to know who it is we trust and who we see as our friends. You know, who we put into positions of power and, and how we are able to keep a finger on them and to help, you know, to help and, you know, uh, overview uh, their actions. It, it's what we have, you know, even with, you know, and I think it's very much the same subject matter. When we come, it comes to trust and security. We all want that mm -hmm. trust and security. And yet we have, uh, you know, uh, organizations like the NSA, National Security Agency, that are, so dishonest even with their own people you know that 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 they're 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 breaking all of the the, the rules uh, that that they uh, claim to be wanting to uphold by knowing what terrorists are doing mm -hmm. you know it we, we we have to know who people are that have numbers on their doors and no name tags who were paying their wages we have to know what the agendas are mm -hmm. where the separation is between the agencies that are always there in the core of government that we don't vote into position these are the civil servants high-ranking people working on black budgets you know that where that line is that separates who these people are and what their agendas are mm -hmm. with those that we did vote and put into position who seem almost to be just simply card players when the real agenda uh, is being conducted by people we're not even allowed to know exist Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I mean, you know, a wide subject, lots of subject matter, uh, all feeding into where we are on the crossroads. But this is, you know, where we are. And uh, if, if we have no choice, I don't believe, at what I call the, the, the 11th hour, you know, at 10 seconds to midnight, mm -hmm. we have significant decisions to make. Mm -hmm. We all want to move off of this crossroads in the right direction. And only truth, only love, if the coherence of both of those coming together across all those platforms, it's only by that that we have a long-term secure future, and that's what we have to work for. You know, with that will come also uh, the hope that we have to provide for our children. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that's why I think that whilst we should never sweep these things under the carpet, it is also very important to not be overwhelmed by the level of the uh, and number of, of problems that we now face, we we have to come home and face the demons. We have to look ourselves in the mirror. We all are contributors in some way to where we actually find ourselves today. We've got to get involved. We've got to get to know who we are, to speak our who we are, to act who we are, to know who our friends and neighbours are, and to rely less upon uh, the idea that government is there for us. Uh, I, you know, I, I say that with care because you know, we're going through a phase right now mm -hmm. which is potentially extremely dangerous where people that think like I do, just simply people who ask questions, people who question authority, which we should all do, are now seen as potential enemy. Uh, this is a very dangerous time. And so, um, you know, I, I, I don't say it in any sense of, you know, uh, we need a revolution because, of course, I'll be on the top list instead of perhaps uh, one further down the, the, uh, the road. Um, uh, but I, I say that very deliberately because, you know, we're speaking to people that – that are listening to this show, mm -hmm. this program, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, uh, it, it's clear. It, it's important to say that we are thinkers and we're people that care. And if that's the worst crime we've committed, then shame on those who see us as a threat. We are people that care, and that is, I believe, the high ground we should all be on. You know, you made an interesting point um, that people should question authority. And when you think about this, um, you know, that kind of conditioning where you accept authority as absolute, be, you know, be, typically begins when you're growing up as a child um, yeah. and in, in schools, institutions, um, especially uh, with employers. You have to fit the status quo. You have to um, be the uh, modeled uh, employee. Um, and if you do question the status quo, you look you're looked down upon as, let's say, a rebel. Yeah. Uh, nobody wants to associate with you because you'd be considered a troublemaker. That's right. And so forth. And um, 
it just seems that society now is is just being conditioned or has been conditioned to accept authority. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I I agree with you. I agree with you. It's it's kind of troubling, but mm-hmm. I, and I I think a lot about it. I, I you know I ask myself what you know why is that that there there's this group of people over here without putting percentages and numbers mm-hmm. we know that would far rather be uh, led than to lead, you know to accept and and, and not um, create waves. Uh, than others and uh, what is it that makes mm-hmm. us different you know why are we uh, to use that term again why are we do- wired so differently mm-hmm. why is it that a whole series of uh, uh, you know ingredients that might for example you know we well, let's just put it this way an ingredient on this a topic an event like going to war or something significant that can change you know uh, humanity in, in, mm-hmm. in its own ways it all has the same ingredients when that that uh, agenda is set and, and described to the public. Now, one might say that that comes, we'll say, from a, a Republican or from a Democrat. Now, th- th- this is the same information, it, and yet uh, it, it is held in such a, a kind of, with such fervor, uh, differently, you know, these these two groups on the same information will be arguing black is white, mm-hmm. and white is black, and it's yes or it's no, and yes, it's the right thing to do, no, it's not, you know, uh, and yet it's the same information. Uh, it, you know, is it that we operate out of uh, truth? Um, it, I don't know, it's a very complex point that you raise, really, a very, very complex point. Mm-hmm. It's what we see as a reality, and our reality is based upon our experience. Mm-hmm. And therefore, the assessment of the same information is very different because one group has had a series of different experiences, uh, personal experiences, to the other. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's, uh, it's a fascinating reasoning as to why we've been brought together like this. Is this a guarantee that we won't agree on anything? Is it a guarantee that something else will maintain control all the time we're in dispute with one another? Why is it that the most difficult thing in that we're unable, it seems, to 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 uh, to resolve, is uh, to love one another. I mean, why is it that, that the planet finds the most difficult thing to do is to love one another? Why is it that not a single government on our planet has got a Department of Peace? Perhaps it just might happen if they did. You know, it, it, I don't know. It's a, it's very very complex uh, in that in that way. Mm-hmm. Okay, now. Changing subjects here, um, you cite in your book that the frequency of events and their impact on the experiencers are indications of a, uh, an immensity of the change underway. Uh, does this mean that as time goes by that the veil separating our world and, say, the etheric world is thinning? Yes, I, I think that's one way of putting it, mm-hmm. that new experiences, uh, things that we, we uh, didn't even see or recognize before, uh, manifest and uh, have a different a different effect and lead us to a different place, but that we see a world that was always there. Uh, it, again, this, this inattentional blindness comes in. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the, the fact that new events, new mysteries, um, uh, cause us to to broaden our concepts and our our thinking mm-hmm. um, um, uh, you know that that uh, will also um, uh, get you might say weigh the dice uh, towards the the completion of a of, of a paradigm shift because it has an effect upon our emotional state you know it, how we feel about things obviously is recorded in a, in the emotion uh, the electrochemical emotional system of our bodies. You know, I think it's just worth for a second, Martin, just kind of the, the way that we, we, we discuss paradigm uh, shift mm-hmm. in the book, which mm-hmm. relates, I think, to what you're, you're saying here, is that when we, we talk about paradigm shift, the tendency is to look at scientific and technological trends that usher in uh, new thinking you know, a new paradigm. Mm -hmm. A great deal of what we are discovering, however, is not, uh, 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 you know, it does not represent a change in science and technology. It could be seen this way. It represents a change in humans. Mm -hmm. New information engages the mind. Events engage the emotions. And emotional shifts push people to expand. 
each person who has experienced a high strangeness event like we've been talking about holds a small piece of a larger picture and it's time to put these pieces together. It's not about what we can theorize or prove. It is about what we experience and how we feel it. It's about the changes our experiences create within us and how that alters the way we see and interact with the world. You know, we're at a turning point, and people's personal stories are more important than ever. I, I think that kind of trending uh, leads us to the central issue, uh, as simple as this sounds. It's almost, it almost sounds crazy come out of my own mouth, but it's, it's like we have to, at this point, in looking ourselves in that huge mirror that humanity has now had placed in front of it, mm -hmm. we have to make our minds up who we want to be. There seems to be that we're confused, that as my friend uh, Mike Pender of the Moody Blues would say, mm -hmm. we are lost in a lost world. You know, um, I had to ask you this question because what comes to mind here are the increased sightings of orbs, UFOs, yeah. uh, silts, um, yeah. angels, images of ascended masters, uh, visions of the fae, the fairy folk, and I'd like to tie this in with uh, Silberry Hill. Um, is it your understanding that there could exist, along with the tour at Glastonbury, an interdimensional portal there where people could conceivably slip into a parallel dimension? Yeah, I don't know that I would put it exactly as you did there, Martin, but if what we're both saying, I think we, we are here, uh, is I would certainly uh, go along with the idea... I might totally agree with you in time, but mm -hmm. I think I most certainly would at this point go along with the idea that those two locations, the Tor and Glastonbury, which was not so far from where I lived, mm -hmm. and much closer to me was Silbury Hill, mm -hmm. are stargates of one kind or another, just to give them terms. Mm -hmm. These are kind of sh uh, chakra points on a living planet mm -hmm. where events uh, of, a, of, a, of a very strange kind uh, do take place. I mean, so I, I always try, I guess it's the engineer inside me, I try to, to start my inquiry with what I know. Uh, there's a lot we don't know, but mm -hmm. what I do know that well, supports the point that you raised there uh, is that these are very highly high strangeness events. Mm -hmm. When when a police officer, and this is a, it's in the book, mm -hmm. and it's it's one that I've been hands on very involved with the investigation. When a police officer, a man whose word that we accept or has accepted in Wiltshire Police Force in Southern England, and it has people put in prison for the rest of their lives, you know, a man who can be trusted, who's reliable, and as a police officer states this in court on a Bible. Mm -hmm. Well, this same man uh, does all of those things in his 25, 30 year ex, um, time in the police force until he drives past Silbury Hill at just after five o'clock in the morning, three years ago, mm -hmm. in a field where there was a crop marking that looked like a Mayan headdress. And there have been many crop markings of in increasing in complexity since 1989 in that same field. Three light beings that he saw and stopped his police car on his way home, actually, he was just coming off shift, and saw three very tall, nearing seven feet tall, uh, beings that were dressed in silver attire with, uh, like, hoods that were dropped at the back of their heads. They had long, blonde hair, very long, well over their shoulders. All looked identical to one another, but one was holding a kind of a wand-type um, device that was waving it through the heads of the plants and the story goes on i mean it, it, he stopped he saw these entities at, at close quarters i flew to england and um uh continued with the research in that field mm -hmm. following this event mm -hmm. um but there's several things to say about it is that that location is important mm -hmm. and it, the uh, experience this man had uh, of course changed his life as it has mine uh, when he w got home, he had uh, lost some time. We cannot account for the time loss mm -hmm. uh, from that experience. What has appeared to go, and these are his words, not mine, something else went home with him. Uh, he has continued to have strange experiences that he can't account for um, uh, since that happened. Uh, so, it, again, it, it, it's a complex situation. 
I am aware, and I can't go into the detail on this one, uh, uh, and I apologize. I, I kind of live my life very much on my sleeve, and sometimes mm -hmm. it comes home to bite me. But mm -hmm. I have a, 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 um, reasons for you know somebody else's security, mm -hmm. uh, why I can't go into naming this individual. But I can mm -hmm. say that the U.S. and U.K. governments uh, are both uh, very aware and this comes from the highest levels in uh, this government, um, of, of events uh, related to an extraterrestrial species that, um, that is, 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 is monitored and, uh, at that location. Um, and I think perhaps that's as much as I'll say on it, but it, mm -hmm. it's, um, it, it's a much wider situation, and it's a very important point uh, that you have raised. Okay, well, um, I'd like to uh, also uh, discuss here um, the topic of crop circles. At first, people noticed simple designs that were linear, and then they progressed into insectograms, and then into the curly man, and then into organic symbols, and finally into complex geometric patterns, specifically fractals. And I'm also noticing also DNA patterns, helixes, spirals, planetary alignments, floral patterns, and, of course, mathematical symbols. Would it be safe to speculate, Colin, that these crop circles are speaking to us on a subconscious level? Yes, that's a great question, and my goodness, that is uh, so, so loaded in more ways than one. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, the answer, uh, as best I can give it to you, uh, mm -hmm. is that both are both conscious and subconscious are involved, and, and, and the reason for that answer um, mm -hmm. I, I need, I think, a little, to, to give you as a, a little bit of background to it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where things get uh, very, very... Um, complicated and difficult uh, because my work initially began to in the gathering of data this is the scientific approach you gather the data you look for correlations you take measurements and you you know it, it then begins to take its own uh, course it depends upon the information and your assessment of it so for the beginning of this work, which I remember is now in the 80s when the you know I coined the term crop circles at that time, uh, we knew we had, Pat Delgado and I, that, who had just then um, uh, finished his work on the Mariner Project with NASA, he and I uh, were with a team with Dr. Terence Meaden, a meteorologist, physicist, and a, a light aircraft pilot, Busty Taylor, and I thought sh I should credit them uh, as part of that team. Mm -hmm. Well, we gathered data, and what we saw was something that was evolving. There mm -hmm. appeared to be a, a language or a message unfolding. But also, uh, we began to be um, to see that there were we were looking, finding different ground features that told us one we can't explain part of this. The uh, the, the other part of it would seem to be that uh, we're human beings are getting involved and in manufacturing. So you have hoaxing and you have the unresolved. Well, uh, years went by, and. Uh, Yes, I continue to feel uh, there is a message. This clearly is something that knows what it's doing. It knows how it's placing these. It, they're being placed in specific places for specific reasons with specific information. And you have covered some of the, pr the major, more primary family types which give us that information, fractals, mathematics, nature's formulas, and others that are related very much to humanity itself. Mm -hmm. Um, well, this is where it gets very complicated, and I think it really is where the research is right now. Not everybody's getting this. It's taken a long time to get this far. This is what's happening. The people that are researching them and have researched them started to have supernatural, paranormal, inexplicable, high strangeness experiences, like that of the police officer and other people. Then, when I was funded for the first time, uh, by Lawrence Rockefeller in New York uh, for two years, uh, I coordinated uh, primarily an undercover operation, which was not very anything I was particularly happy about. But what we did in that two-year period, actually professionals other than myself, I simply coordinated it. These were... Um, uh, uh, private detectives, ex-police officers, etc., who had 
access to intelligence that I could not as, as a civilian have. Mm -hmm. And we got to know who we're making. This is the point. And if it's missed, then we lose a lot here. Mm -hmm. People making crop circles. Now, th th when I made the announcement on BBC television in the year 2000, that 80% of those that we'd looked at in that 1999-2000 year period of that investigation were made by people, and I had the evidence, 20% were not, we couldn't resolve. Um, a, a, a bombshell went off, and, you know, I was kind of ostracized and had hate mail, etc. Well, what was being missed here was not only that 20% couldn't be unresolved, but in the 80%, and here's the central theme, the important thing here, people making crop markings were a very major part of a bigger mystery because they were being prompted this is later, and, and it's it, throughout the book, you will see it, mm -hmm. uh, prompted to make specific designs in specific places, and often, unbeknown to them, they would find that others were in the same field doing the same thing the same night. And so what we have here, um, you know, is a much bigger, a much bigger mystery, but one that directly involves the mind of man in the creation of designs and the placement of designs, that it has engaged us in a conversation we didn't know we were having. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's, it, it forms the platform uh, on which we have to, ha to open a new discussion. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, Cynthia and I are hoping, and the, the, the feedback is that the book is having that kind of effect. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'll be doing some other programs, you know, that follow yours uh, on um, this and more to come. Yeah, um, I'm not quite sure how I got there in this, that, that, that response, Martin, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, that, that, that's what's happening. Interesting. Now, you also cited in your book um, some anomalies experienced by, by people when entering these crop circles, one of which deals with witnessing shadowy figures. Uh, are you able to discuss this in further detail, Colin? Yes, I mean, I've, I've had it myself, um, uh -huh. I've seen it myself, mm -hmm. um, and also the, those people that we've just talked about, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, those that make crop circles, they've had the same, exactly the same. I've spoken to a team, um, well, actually several teams, but this particular incident, uh, you know, I'm referring to came from one particular team. They were close to completing a design which they felt compelled, there's an important word, mm -hmm. uh, you know, compelled to make in this particular place. They mm -hmm. were almost finished when in one part of the field at a distance uh, orbs of light started to show up mm -hmm. and started moving towards them and then flinching glances in the right at the periphery of their vision uh, were these dark shadows that that they felt you know their interpretation of it was that these were uh, individuals and people or entities mm -hmm. and that you know once they they they'd allowed the their eyes to directly look where the shadow had been there was nothing there and mm -hmm. yet there was the movement going on uh, on the periphery that all of them were experiencing this is not like one person with a a problem uh, with their eyesight and i've had uh, i've had the same thing i I've got to say, Martin, that um, I don't know what will happen during this program, for example. Uh, I thought it was going to happen about uh, 15 minutes ago in, in this program. Mm -hmm. um, I started to get uh, uh, something that has, has started to happen with me since I started this work in the last, uh, probably the last seven or eight years. It's happened twice during the recent media inter interviews about this book, mm -hmm. uh, where the background ambience, it's not only a matter of, you know, your... Uh, uh, experience of catching something at the corner of your eye, the ambience, uh, the background white noise, it'll be worth listening to your recording when you're, we're finished with our interview, mm -hmm. because the background white noise, the, the, the highway, a small highway that's outside of our house, the animals, the birds, you know, the, the normal background, mm -hmm. uh, suddenly 
has gone. It goes. It just disappears, and you feel like you're talking into a vacuum. I nearly, uh, uh, around, you know, a few minutes ago in this conversation I'm having with you, mm-hmm. uh, I was about to actually say, you know, are we still on? Uh, are we still recording? Are you still hearing me? Mm-hmm. Because that started to happen. Mm. And the last time it happened, I, you know, I won't go into programs, but they were they were both uh, well known, um, you know, radio programs that I did a, a short time ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, when that happened, uh, the lights flickered at uh, both ends, one in Arizona and here in Connecticut. Mm. As that happened, and three computers, and they're all around me right now as I'm speaking to you, in case we need to go into database. Right. Um, the three computers. Uh, rebooted without any steps or actions uh, asked of me uh, at that same time. And so these are, these are new high strangers events that, that are certainly seem to be escalating. Um, they're a part of something else. I don't know whether that's related to some external uh, government type activity or whether it, it is related to entities that are living with us on this, uh, this plane. Uh, uh, through some other some some other dimensional uh, input, but it, it, but these are facts. I mean, the, the, mm-hmm. what I've related to you was recorded in two recent programs, and those are just two that I can provide in just recent times. Mm, that's interesting. Now, have you yourself ever been questioned by uh, the governmental authorities with respect to your research and what you're doing? Well, I've, I've advised uh, Margaret Thatcher's government. You know, uh-huh. I've supplied the reports to the chief scientific advisor, uh-huh. Dr. Fisk, to them. But I have never been. Uh, now, this I have to be careful with how uh-huh. I say this, only because uh-huh. I want to be accurate. Sure. I, I can talk about this. Um, I have never received uh, in my presence somebody who says, um, "This is who I am. Uh-huh. Uh, I work for MI5 or six or CIA, MS, NSA, or whatever, mm-hmm. and I, we want to talk to you about this. I've never been approached in that way. What I can tell you is that uh, when my own internal instincts and my amber light goes off, as I call it, mm-hmm. my instinct is that this person talking to me now, this particular interview that I am doing, and I'm not referring to yours, mm-hmm. uh, when a crew that turns up at my door and they're, and they're different to anything I've ever seen before, mm-hmm. my flag go up and research I've done with with uh, contacts I do have mm-hmm. uh, government in some of these agencies later confirming that these are either uh, what well, are intelligence people and so uh, the answer is yes I have but not knowingly mm-hmm. I, I've had uh, I ha- well, let me just say this sure. there's one example I had a film crew um, I've never said this on air. Uh, I, uh, you know, it, it, it happened, so I'm going to say so. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a film crew came here. It was set up in a strange way. Terminology was different. I didn't foolishly uh, fully question what was going on. I was told it was a program that was going to be filmed. Uh, you know, it would go out into Europe first and into the U.S. later. Mm-hmm. This is about four, four to five years ago now. And I agreed to do it. They came to my home. Uh, they arrived. Uh, a vehicle blacked out windows in many aerials. They got equipment which was better than any I've ever seen as a uh, you know an on-site recording. I've you know had many before. I've done them in obviously in TV studios where they're fully equipped. But this was different. These guys came with a number of cameras, and usually they do one with move the camera for cutaways. They have their cameras. They're all. Uh, radio controlled. They're talking to somebody in a remote um, uh, place. Uh, the questions that were asked of me were they were all given with uh, so that they had received different answers to questions placed in different ways. They were checking in with somebody on it that they were asking me for router information because they wanted to go to somebody else in some other distant location. I was so suspicious of this. Uh, I, 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 in between times, they, their technical guys were going out to get more info, um, e- equipment from their car. I went out through my back door here on this little farm. I grabbed my camera, and I was out the front of the house as they were at the back of their vehicle, two of them, and I took photographs of the license plate numbers in the vehicle. One of them saw me do that. It came at me like I had committed an enormous crime, very agitated and excited, asking me what I was doing. And I said to him, but you're in my home. I have no idea who you are. 
and I've taken a photograph of you and your vehicle and your license plate number. Mm -hmm. His whole tone changed. I did research on this uh, later to discover that this was asset building, asset building by the CIA. Mm. And now, so, you know, no, I, no, I was never approached as this is, you know, the United States government and we're wanting to, for a future time when we need to be dealing with some of these things mm -hmm. in a real way, we want to look at our assets and how we're going to use them. In other words, how we're going to either destroy you mm -hmm. or how we're going to use you. Um, anyway, I think I'll probably I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, okay, this, that's, uh, that's a very interesting uh, story you've told me here, Colin. Now, I'd like to put this question to you here. Let's suppose that you're an extraterrestrial and that your race frequented this planet every 1,000 or so years, and then visiting this planet, uh, you were required to survey the civilization. Uh, what would your report indicate on the status on the condition of the planet wow what a great question what a great question well um given of course that uh, i would have access to far superior technology mm -hmm. and i would have access to the minds of each and every human being um, i would know that the mindset is that there are two groups uh, mm -hmm. one a group uh, p perhaps uh, seated here from another species in another place mm -hmm. was now controlling um, the uh, the masses on the, the planet and mm -hmm. that effectively they had been caged in unbeknowing to themselves placed into a cage which would become an electro um, a, a sorry a digital cage mm -hmm. um, in which they could not basically um, uh, would not be permitted mm -hmm. to uh, expand and evolve as a species. So their actions were controlled precisely by this other group and uh, that their actions were destroying um, the planet itself. I, I would report back that this wonderful, extraordinary um, uh, experience of planet Earth it, in all of its other life forms uh, was... Uh, beginning to show signs of interference that it would not recover from, uh, from this species, and that um, either we should uh, inflict an upgrade upon all of them, both groups, and permit um, a, a coherence to take place between all of the life forms on the planet, uh, or perhaps remove uh, some of these, or one or both of these entities. Uh, that, that, I think, would be my, my report based upon what I, I would see. I would certainly question whether the word intelligence could be used at all, mm -hmm. you know, based upon the actions of those present. <coughs> Interesting. Okay, Colin, we are approaching the end of the first hour here. Would you care to remind the listeners of your website and how anyone can reach you should uh, they be interested in contacting you. Uh, thank you, Martin. Well, uh, anybody can uh, look in any time, either for books, this book, or any other of the material that I've produced at colinandrews.net. Mm -hmm. um, and they can always contact me on the contact button, uh, which is uh, on that website, scrolled across the top of the site. Uh, I do see every uh, email that is sent and uh, respond to as many as I can. Okay. Any closing comments you'd like to make for the listeners, Colin? Well, uh, uh, that I think that we, we have entered a period of time that uh, certainly requires a calmness, um, a respect for each other. And I think in the short term to know who your friends and your neighbors are um, and not to rely uh, blindly uh, mm -hmm. uh, upon our governments, but the, the hope is that um, the changes underway now uh, will put us all on the same page. Interesting. Okay. Once again, the book is called On the Edge of Reality, uh, written by yourself, Colin Andrews, and your wife, Cynthia Andrews. Um, it's been an interesting chat. I appreciate you taking the time here to talk with me for the first hour, Colin. And I'll see you again for the second hour. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks, Myron. Thank you, Colin. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.
That's it for the first hour on As Above, So Below Radio. Tune in for the second hour by subscribing to HolisticAdvocate.com where Colin will further discuss the alarming reality of chemtrails. Orbs. Are these objects etheric vehicles to transport consciousness? The spiral phenomenon and their growing presence all over the globe. And the worldwide mystery known as the hum and the trumping sounds heard which some have claimed as sounding supernatural. Is the earth shifting in frequency, and is this sound many have heard considered coming from the planet, and much more. Listening to As Above, So Below Radio.